Now, I've been writing articles and, and producing videos like this for a while now, and I'm often asked about how I go about my research when producing books like Golgotha, my murder mystery set in the trenches of the First World War, which is based on very real events and people. I was even recently asked to talk about this very subject during the Capricorn Coast Writers' Festival. Well, today's article will show you just how weird things can get if, if you don't just stop searching when you find the answer that you want, but to follow up anything you find interesting or suspicious. So join me as we chat today about thylacines, and please like and subscribe to the channel as there's a lot more of this wackiness to come. Now the Tasmanian tiger has been in the news a lot lately, with some suggesting there is a strong chance of using some of the material stored in the various museums and universities around the place to try and clone them and bring them back. Well in my research for the bizarre natural history of Australia, I have been finding some, shall we say, untapped resources. Exploring these, I found a part of the thylacine's history that's rarely talked about. How the animals ended up in menageries and circuses. Oddly, circuses in Australia have a very long history, with groups of touring companies being one of the premier entertainments in the country for decades until basically cinema arrived. Our modern view of a circus is a lot different to what they grew into during their height. A hundred years ago, anything that even resembled a zoo was little more than a menagerie of local critters, and the only time the general public got to see an exotic animal was when the circus came to town. Now there has been a lot written about how a few zoos around the world hosted thylacine displays, and I may do a video about them later, but what really caught my interest was how Tasmanian tigers began showing up in circuses and private menageries. Now the first Australian circus began in 1847 and was created by Robert Avis Radford, who had a few horse displays, acrobats and clowns. Many of these were former convicts, and it proved so successful that they were soon followed by a growing number of family operated troops that toured around the colonies. By the 1880s, the most successful local circuses had grown to extraordinary sizes, and some are still household names today. The Fitzgerald brothers and the Worth brothers were probably the largest, and when the St. Leon Circus entered town, it had grown so large that they had a parade that is estimated to have been half a mile long. St. Leon seems to have been born out of a number of earlier circuses, but it grew in size and fame quickly, picking up acts and animals as it went. By 1884 the troop was advertising in the locations they were about to visit, and they would do this by having posted plastered all over the town, and these would list all the things you could see. For example, at the 1884 circus you were going to see, Gus St. Leon, the champion bareback rider of Australia. Alfred St. Leon, the great somersault rider of the world. Walter St. Leon, the peerless horseman. Now I'll point out all three of course the owners of the St. Leon Circus, so I'm not sure how great or peerless they were. You could also see Master Ewan, the uncomparable wire walker. Mons Show, the champion tumbler. Alberto, the premier horizontal bar performer. The Walpole Brothers, kings of the carpet circle. I have no idea what carpet circles were. You would also get to see some of the most rare and curious animals from the most remote parts of the world like a Bengal tiger, a royal tiger, a black tiger, leopards, mongooses, five performing camels, what they performed I really want to know, performing monkeys and dogs, the great sun bear, and three Tasmanian tigers. Just months later the advertising say they went from three to four tigers. So maybe they bought a new one, or maybe one of their tigers had been pregnant at the time and a new baby had been born. The circus also claimed that these thylacines were the first put on display, but this simply isn't true. I guess we'll chalk that up to their great and peerless ability to sell themselves. In 1858, newspapers like the Hobart Mercury noted that native hyenas had gone on display at Gilbert's buildings on Brisbane Street, and this animal was part of Wombwell's menagerie. Wombwells began in the early 1800s, and though it was stationed in England, it travelled all over the place. Its owners had cleverly caught on to the idea that London was pretty much the centre of the world at the time, and so vessels from all over were constantly pulling into port. They began organising with some of these ships to bring exotic animals with them when they returned, and one of these brought with them thylacines. And as a side note, if we travel to 1906, the Scottish Zoo and Circus 
which was associated with Wombles at the time, received a thylacine and began claiming that this was the first of its kind ever to reach Europe. Ah, circus folk. The fact that the first thylacine had reached Europe nearly a century earlier had been placed on display in the London Zoo, well, let's just say, why ruin a good story with the truth? Now it's interesting that one result of all these circuses and menageries collecting exotic wildlife, like the thylacine, was often when the animals died, the remains of these creatures often found their way into the displays of museums. It's very possible that the stuffed thylacine looking at you with glass eyes at the Smithsonian or the British Museum once roamed your local zoo or circus. Now from what I can see, one of the very last Australian circuses to carry live thylacines was Fitzgerald Brothers. They not only received a specimen after visiting Tasmania, after eight weeks sadly on the road, the animal had died, and it looks like they ordered and another one was caught and sent to them. There is also a very unusual article from 1901 that seems to indicate that when the circus returned to Tasmania, they set up a flock of sheep, possibly for feeding their animals, out to pasture. However, when the shepherd they'd hired headed out to collect them, he came face to face with an enormous tiger, which he tried to chase, but the animal proved too quick. Unfortunately, the shepherd's dog, however, proved up for the game and quickly caught up and cornered the thylacine. The predator turned on its tormentor and was about to kill the dog when the shepherd arrived and dispatched the thylacine with a few whacks of its head and a knife to the throat. I guess the reason why I'm saying this is, even in 1901, it seems like thylacines were still reasonably common, that they were just showing up every so often around the place. So there are reports that the thylacine was already in danger, it was already becoming endangered, becoming extinct, and that they were becoming rare. But by reading these sorts of accounts and the way that, and how people were constantly coming across them, to me it sounds like there was still a reasonably decent population still there. And that it must have been the absolute deplorable act of putting out a bounty on their heads and farmers and things actually going out and shooting them just for the money, that was the serious problem. That's what really got rid of them. So getting back to the thylacines and circuses, I was amazed to find this was not all just happening in Europe and Australia. And one of the finds I'm most proud of in this chain of research was the Sells Brothers Quadruple Alliance Museum Menagerie Caravan and Circus that came out of Columbus, Ohio. Not only would this circus grow to be one of the largest in the world, they also travelled extensively everywhere, including Australia. The circus first arrived in the colonies in 1891 to begin their tour by rail. And if you have any sort of interest in such things, there is a fantastic document that I've attached to a link to below. It's the travel book from the circus during their journey. It not only notes how much was spent and how much was made, but there is information about locations visited, the interaction between the locals and the carnival folk, a complete list of personnel, and a series of general observations about their trip. Altogether, the circus travelled well over 6,000 miles between the colonies before returning, in great triumph, to the US. This booklet also explains that when they left Australia, they did so with a number of stowaways. It would seem there are a number of Australians who decided to try and run away and join the circus. When the circus returned to the US, they began advertising for their next series of tours around the states. And what I love is how proudly they boast about their time down under, using this trip as a banner or as a badge of honor. It's on one of these posters, however, that we see that it was not just humans who had stowed away with the circus. Sells Brothers began proudly announcing their latest exhibit, which they had brought back with them from Australia, a menagerie of the southern continent's bizarre wildlife. As the poster itself announces, a whole menagerie's an aviary of recently imported Australian animals and birds secured in Australia by Messrs. Sells and Brothers while touring the South Sea Empire. More kangaroos, beautiful birds and feathered giants than all other shows in America exhibit. And what animals do they show on the poster? Well, there's kangaroos, emus, a dingo, a thorny devil, a black swan, a lyrebird, a platypus, some snakes, birds of every shape and colour, including some cockatoos, and I will get back to them in a minute. But almost under the feet of everything is, I guess what you'd call a dog cat, and I'm assuming that is actually a Tasmanian devil. But what we do have running up the hill in the background is a thylacine. 
Now, the Sells Brothers Circus was, as I said, one of the largest in the world, and it has been part of several documentaries over the years. Most of the footage that you watch is of all the elephants. They had dozens of elephants. They claim they had more elephants than any other circus. But while we're watching one of these, I noticed a short section that contained, well, sadly, not a thylacine, but some other Australians, several white cockatoos performing. Before we leave Sells Brothers, there is one more incident I uncovered that tickled my paleontology funny bone. When the circus first arrived in New South Wales, the colony's custom services slammed down on them like a steel trap. The circus required a lot of horses to move everything around and to perform, and all of these horses were quarantined when it was noticed some of the animals were suffering from lampers, which is this strange swelling of the gums. Today it seems to be just a nuisance, but apparently back then it was a serious issue. All of the horses were placed into quarantine, and the circus only got them back when they sailed home several months later. Though it seems the circus agreed with all this, it would seem this was something of an affront that they would not forget. Step into now the Chicago's World Fair in 1893. This was one of the largest world's fairs, and famously introduced the world to the first Ferris wheel, and also had at the time the serial killer H.H. H. Holmes running around killing visitors with his infamous murder house. At the time, Australia was still not a nation, so many of the colonies sent exhibits to try and garnish investors and businesses to come and start up down under. The New South Wales government sent a number of displays, including a mineral display to reveal the colony's vast resources that were just sitting around in the ground, waiting to be collected. Gold, silver, opals, and especially coal. This display contained a lot of wealth, and at some point it caught the eye of the Sells brothers, who immediately had their lawyers seize the wealth as payment slash revenge for the time the New South Wales government quarantined their horses. Basically, they wanted to be reimbursed for all the extra costs this occurred when the circus had to find new animals for their time in Australia. At first, rumours of this happening in the colonies was treated as a joke, but things became very serious when Sir Arthur Renwick, the New South Wales Commissioner in charge of the display in Chicago, contacted the government and confirmed it was all true and that the display had been seized by the Sheriff of Cook County, where Chicago is situated. What happened next is amazingly convoluted. New South Wales was still a colony, and so they contacted the Secretary of State for the Colonies in London. George Frederick Samuel Robinson, first Marquis of Ripon, known professionally as the Viscount Goderich, seemed to have little interest in the incident and didn't seem to do much about it. The government then contacted the new incoming colonial governor, Sir Robert William Duff. He too didn't seem to do a lot step in the newly minted third time Premier of New South Wales, Sir George Richard Dibbs. Now in the papers, this new head of the New South Wales colonial government was quoted saying, My own opinion is that the colony went to Chicago as a guest of the American Republic. We expect protection against our exhibits being made responsible for any action or wrong committed on the citizens. Had we strictly enforced the quarantine laws, we might have greatly inconvenienced the cells. But instead, we quarantined only their horses they made money here, and it is thus they have treated us on their return. So, the New South Wales government now contacted the UK representative, who then in turn contacted the English ambassador to the USA in Washington, who then contact the US government and have the display returned. This was not a small matter, by the way. Many newspapers in the US carry the story of how Chicago had seized the display from the New South Wales pavilion for Sells Brothers. The New South Wales and English governments getting upset at Chicago at a time when the county and the country was trying to show off their own nation with the World's Fair must have struck a chord as this action triggered the US federal courts to then send a writ to the Cook County courts that govern Chicago to have the display returned, pointing out that a private citizen group had absolutely no rights to take the property of a foreign government. After all this, the display was returned. And those US newspapers? Well, they actually carried something interesting that hasn't been reported in the Australian papers, and that is that they didn't believe Sells Brothers actually meant to go through with it, that they were doing this as a way of advertising the circus and to get it in the news. Turns out this act had a bit of a reverse effect, and New South Wales itself seems to have won the PR battle, as their pavilion not only became very popular, 
Many of those same newspapers wrote up huge pieces on the colony, its worth and its future, helping to create a bit of a run on the colony and help build up foreign investment. Okay, so that last bit, not a lot to do with thylacines, but it highlights just how strange the world was back then and how complicated history can be. It also shows that research can be genuinely fun. So find a thread, pull on it, and keep going. You never know what you're going to find out. And we're done. I hope you enjoyed that. Thylacines in circuses. Who knew? So please like and subscribe so you can check in later because there's more thylacine stuff coming. And also please grab a copy of my book, especially the latest one, Golgotha. It's a generally fun read. And I'll talk to you later.